start again in verse 12. And Jim, no one that heard that. Um, in verse 12, it says, therefore, strengthen in the King James and ASV say, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And that's very similar to what is uh, recorded in the 35th chapter of uh, 35th, uh, for third verse in the 35th chapter of Isaiah. It says, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. So the, firm, the strong are to encourage the weak, whoever the strong are and, and whoever the weak are. And in verse 13, it says, make straight paths for your feet so that which is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So they are to be marching onward to the uh, heavenly Jerusalem. The stronger brethren are to make the path straight and smooth and, and so by doing so that even the lame may be encouraged to persevere in the straight path to the heavenly end. In verses 12 and 13, both Isaiah and the writer have reference to the return of the uh, Jews under Zerubbabel from captivity in Babylon uh, to freedom in Ju Jerusalem. And this is an earthly return. And also to the march of the redeemed under Christ from captivity by sin to the freedom and subsequently greater enjoyment of the heavenly Jerusalem. And you may recall uh, the uh, Messianic prophecy in uh, Isaiah the 40th chapter verse 3 the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God you know make things uh, for others to follow in verse 14 it says pursue and the King James says follow and the ASV says follow after Pursue peace with all people. Um, to be people or men, men was added by uh, translators. People is probably a better translation, but uh, pursue peace with all people and holiness. And that's the holiness of verse 10 above. Or sanctification, if you want to use sanctification, same idea without which no one will see the Lord. In 1 Peter 1.16, we read, uh, be holy for I am holy. <clears throat> so we must, must be holy. If the Hebrew Christians were to be re reviled and persecuted, it should be because they are Christians and not for any other reason. In 1 Peter, the third chapter verses 15 through 17, we read, to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who reviled your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. All people uh, above would include those who are not Christians. In Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 10, it says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. And that includes non-Christians, but especially to those who uh, are of the household of faith, Christians. In verse 15 of chapter 12, it says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, um, that uh, means one opposed to the gospel and who labors to ruin the faith of others, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 15, where we read there, because of false prophets, to come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So there's going to be people that 
have this root of bitterness who are they come in sheep's clothing. They're actually wolves, false prophets. And it says, by this, uh, many become defiled. Now, one should not forget to carefully examine his own heart and conduct while at the same time looking out for the brethren and looking out for those uh, wolves and sheep clothings too. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 5, we are to examine ourselves as to whether or not we are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are qualified. So we must always employ this self examination to be sure that we don't let any root of bitterness uh, creep upon us. <clears throat> in says in verse 16, lest there be any fornicator, fornicator. <clears throat> uh, that really in includes one who's uh, given up the sensual lust and pleasure or a profane person uh, that denotes one who's not allowed to cross over the threshold of the temple. <clears throat> that means heathen, an holy person, uh, unhallowed person. That's uh, one who's profane, a profane person like Esau. <clears throat> Well, why was he profane? Because for one morsel of food, he sold his birthright. So don't let uh, anyone come short of the grace of God for any reason, and particularly because of apostasy, and by that apostasy, apostasy uh, corrupt others. Now Esau thought so little of the privileges and responsibilities that he had as the firstborn that he gave it away for a simple bowl of porridge, oatmeal, if you will. <clears throat> in the 17th verse, for you know that afterwards when he wanted to inherit the blessing, that is to receive from Isaac the blessing of the firstborn, he, he was rejected. Isaac blessed Jacob in the place of Esau for he found no place for repentance. <clears throat> the apostate, he's gonna stay an apostate, has no access to repentance. The truly a repentant man, uh, person may have forgiveness of sins, but he may still suffer the present consequences of the sin. <clears throat> he sought it with tears. Uh, he saw diligently sought it with tears. The mistake of Esau, once committed and the blessing given to Jacob, he was committed forever. It couldn't be changed. <clears throat> In verses 18 through 29, we have further warnings against apostasy and, and further exhortation. It says in verse 18, 4, which connects this verse to the previous verses, for you have not come to the mountain. Uh, mountain is not in the Hebrew, but it's uh, understood, so the translators included it. Said, you have not come to the mountain that may be touched. This uh, new mountain is not physical. And that burn with fire and the blackness and darkness and tempest. <clears throat> He's talking about a spiritual mountain. And if you uh, read back in Deuteronomy about the, uh, the physical mountain, <clears throat> in the verse 11 of chapter 4, it says, Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven and darkness, cloud and, and thick darkness. <clears throat> in the fifth chapter, verse 23 of Deuteronomy, it says, So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, that you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And in the 15th verse of chapter 9, so I turned and came down to the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire, and the two tablets of the covenants were in my hands. Mountain of this uh, verse uh, contrasts with the mountains on which the law of Moses was given. 
And the spiritual mountain is more awesome than the earthly mountain, Mount Sinai. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the uh, people were afraid uh, because of the, you know, the, what happened on the uh, Mount Sinai. This contrast points out the superiority of the gospel over the law given on Sinai. In verse 19, it says, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. And uh, <clears throat> in Exodus 19, chapter verses 16 through 19, uh, we hear there the sound of the trumpet, uh, you know, thunderings and lightnings, and thick cloud on the mountain, trumpet sound, and, and the camp trembled. So the people were, were very afraid. And in verse uh, 18, 19 of, of Exodus 20, they witnessed the thundering and lightning, sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. They trembled and they stood afar off. And they told Moses, to, you speak to us and we'll hear, but not let, let not God speak with us. They were uh, very fearful. <clears throat> But now, now we have a spiritual uh, mountain. In verse 20, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And again, in that uh, 19th chapter of Exodus, it says, you shall set bounds for the people all around saying, teach, teach yourselves that you not go up to the mountain or touch the base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. So it's a terrifying uh, ordeal there in verse 21 of Hebrews 12 chapter says, and so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now the events on Mount Sinai are emphasized here, but the gospel is even more significant and awesome, if you will. If Moses was terrified by the magnificence of such events, and the gospel is superior to the law of Moses, how much more should we be terrified and afraid to apostatize from the law of Christ? And that's what he's telling these uh, Hebrew Christians. By the way, uh, this saying of Moses, you know, is not found in the Old Testament. That, that there's Pentateuch. So how do we know that Moses said this? The writer, uh, most likely the Apostle Paul, was infallibly guided by the Holy Spirit to pen these words. So if Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, said that Moses said these things, then Moses said these things, regardless of, uh, regardless of whether or not his was recorded in the Pentateuch. The emphasis uh, is that we no longer have a tangible fountain from which divine revelation is given in a cloud. The new covenant was given openly, openly by a mediator, that is the Christ, who, unlike Moses on the mountain, is approachable to us by his atoning blood and now sits at the right hand of God making intercession, intercession for us. <clears throat> In verse 22, he says, but you have come in, in, in this verse, the next two as Christians come to uh, it, kind of, it, it's mentioned in eight places, uh, all spiritual. So you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. And there'll be 10,000 angels in heaven, but Jesus would be greater than them all. <clears throat> they have come to the spiritual Mount Zion, the spiritual Jerusalem. The Hebrew Christians are told that they are citizens of the spiritual mountain and city. As it says in Philippians 3rd chapter verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await for the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And continuing on with the uh, eight places that, uh, that they have come to, it says to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, 
to God, the judge of all. He judges all by means of Jesus Christ and his word. We see Acts, the 17, verse 31, it says there, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's a given assurance to this, of this by all, by raising him from the dead. <clears throat> and of course, in John 12th uh, chapter, verse uh, 48, First, we know well, he who rejects me and does not receive my words, as that will judge him, the words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. <clears throat> so it's God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Uh, the spirits of the redeemed from Adam to now. You might look at Revelations, the 15th chapter, verses, uh, the 7th chapter, verses 15 to 17, it says there, Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away, wipe away every tear from their eyes. <clears throat> Now, uh, this, uh, you know, the General Assembly of the Church, the first, first one, the rich in heaven, that refers to the Church of Christ now on earth, but whose names uh, who are registered in heaven. Christ is called the firstborn in, in uh, Colossians, first chapter, verse 15. And uh, Christians are called as first fruits in James, verse chapter, verse 18. Reading on in verse uh, 24 of chapter 12, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the blood of sprinkling, uh, the, the blood, of, uh, blood of Jesus better than blood required in the old covenant offerings and sacrifices. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. You may refer uh, to uh, chapter 11, verse 4 here in Hebrews. The Jews at Mount Sinai grew near to Moses as the mediator of the old covenant. But now we draw nigh to Jesus as the mediator of the better and superior new covenant. In verse 25, it says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape or refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Now the superior privileges and blessing of the new covenant available to the Hebrew Christians greatly increased their obligations. Jesus had recorded in part in Luke 12, 48, that for everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. In uh, 1226, we read, whose voice then shook the earth, that, that is, at Mount Sinai. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. <clears throat> and that uh, come from Haggai, the second chapter, verses 6 through 7, since we uh, studied the Minor prophets, I'm sure you remember it, but I'll just go over it again. For this, for this says the Lord of hosts, once more, that is, it's a little while, I will make, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. In verse 27, we read now this, yet once more, in any case, the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that things which cannot be shaken may, uh, may remain. So uh, only the eternal spiritual kingdom will remain. The earthly kingdom of the old law is going to go away. In verse 28, 
since since we uh, are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fears. The spiritual kingdom of the church will not be shaken and it will not be removed or replaced. Say, so therefore, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. That's Hebrews 10, verse 23. In 2 Peter uh, 1, verse 11, we say, it says, therefore, so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 29, it says, for our God is a consuming fire. That comes from uh, Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse 24. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire fire a jealous God. To the faithful in Jesus Christ, God is love, life, and light. But to the willfully disobedient, the apostate, uh, which the Hebrew Christians were in danger of becoming, he has always been a consuming fire. Nothing else remains for the apostate but a certain fearful expectation of judgment in fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. And that's uh, from the 27th verse of uh, Hebrews 10. In chapter 13, it says, these are some concluding moral directions. Let brother, brotherly love continue. Brotherly love is the Greek word Philadelphia, which we get the English word Philadelphia. That's the natural love between fleshly brothers and sisters. But it, here it means the love of uh, all Christians should have for each other. Uh, for as Abram said in Lot, we be brethren. Genesis 13th chapter verse 8. In verse 2, it says, let us uh, do not forget to, inter inter uh, to entertain strangers. Now, that was a duty under the law of Moses. In uh, Leviticus 19, chapter verse 34, it says, the stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. He says, for by doing so, some have in unwittingly entertained angels. And we're not going to read uh, all that, but uh, you recall uh, in verse, uh, Genesis 18, chapter verse 2 through 10, there were uh, three men standing in there and uh, you know, appearing to Abraham and, and Sarah. There were angels there in verses 19, 1 through 3. Uh, yeah, the angels also came to Sodom and Lot was sitting at the gate. Remember that? So angels had appeared before. <clears throat> Hospitality uh, was to be extended to strangers in the love of and between brethren. Now, that was a notable char characteristic of the early Christians. And it could be, perhaps, was one of the reasons that Christianity spread so rapidly. Now, the he even the heathens could recognize this trait, but this trait was not limited to brethren in faith, but extended to all as we read before Galatians 6, verse 10. In verse 3 of chapter 13, uh, remember the prisoners, uh, in particular, those who are in prison because of their faith, but in general, just prisoners of all classes. Uh, classes. Remember the prison, prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, uh, this is a qualifier to what 
to the prisoners, it excludes those who are receiving the just rewards for crimes. It said, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. We are subject to such calamities as long as, long as we are here in the present world that these people were experiencing. In verse uh, four, marriage is honorable among all in the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. He's, he's saying here, don't be like the uh, heathen around you. In all respects, let your marriage be held in, in honor and fidelity between the marriage partners to may the uh, uh, fidelity between the marriage partners be scrupulously maintained. God will judge those who fail to do so, for God is a consuming fire, as we just uh, read. Well, I see my time is up, so we will begin again next week with the fifth verse of chapter 13, and we will finish Hebrews next week. And you might uh, be thinking about uh, what we're going to be covering next. And what we will cover next is Galatians. So it's a fairly short book. So you would uh, read that ahead of time. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>